From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter One The Gun Club During the War of the Rebellion, a new and influential club was established in the city of Baltimore, in the state of Maryland. It is well known with what energy the taste for military matters became developed amongst that nation of shipowners, shopkeepers, and mechanics. Simple tradesmen jumped their counters to become extemporized captains, colonels, and generals, without having ever passed the school of instruction at West Point. Nevertheless, they quickly rivaled their compeers of the old continent, and, like them, carried off victories by dint of lavish expenditure in ammunition, money, and men. But the point in which the Americans singularly distanced the Europeans was in the science of gunnery. Not, indeed, that their weapons retained a higher degree of perfection than theirs, but that they exhibited unheard-of dimensions, and consequently attained hitherto unheard-of ranges. In point of grazing, plunging, oblique, or unfilading, or point-blank firing, the English, French, and Prussians have nothing to learn. But their cannon, howitzers, and mortars are mere pocket pistols compared with the formidable engines of the American artillery. This fact need surprise no one. The Yankees, the first mechanicians in the world, are engineers, just as the Italians are musicians and the Germans metaphysicians, by right of birth. Nothing is more natural, therefore, than to perceive them applying their audacious ingenuity to the science of gunnery. Witness the marvels of Parrot, Dahlgren, and Rodman. The Armstrong, Palliser, and Bellew guns were compelled to bow before their transatlantic rivals. Now when an American has an idea, he directly seeks a second American to share it. If there be three, they elect a president and two secretaries. Given four, they name a keeper of records, and the office is ready for work. Five, they convene a general meeting, and the club is fully constituted. So things were managed in Baltimore. The inventor of a new cannon associated himself with the caster and the borer. Thus was formed the nucleus of the gun club. In a single month after its formation, it numbered 1,833 effective members and 30,565 corresponding members. One condition was imposed as a sine qua non upon every candidate for admission into the association, and that was the condition of having designed, or more or less, perfected a cannon, or in default of a cannon, at least a firearm of some description, it may, however, be mentioned that mere inventions of revolvers, five-shooting carbines, and similar small arms met with but little consideration. Artillerists always commanded the chief place of favor. The estimation in which these gentlemen were held, according to one of the most scientific exponents of the gun club, was proportional to the masses of their guns and in the direct ratio of the square of the distances attained by their projectiles. The gun club once founded, it is easy to conceive the result of the inventive genius of the Americans. Their military weapons attained colossal proportions, and their projectiles, exceeding the prescribed limits, unfortunately occasionally cut in two some unoffending pedestrians. These inventions, in fact, left far in the rear the timid instruments of European artillery. It is but fair to add that these Yankees, brave as they have ever proved themselves to be, did not confine themselves to theory and formulae, but that they paid heavily, in propria persona, for their inventions. Amongst them were to be counted officers of all ranks, from lieutenants to generals, military men of every age, from those who were just making their debut in the profession of arms, up to those who had grown old on the gun carriage. Many had found their rest on the field of battle whose names figured in the Book of Honor of the Gun Club, and of those who made good their return, the greater proportion bore the marks of their indisputable valor. Crutches, wooden legs, artificial arms, steel hooks, Kachuk jaws, silver craniums, platinum noses, were all to be found in the collection, and it was calculated by the great statistician Pitcairn that throughout the gun club there was not quite one arm between four persons, and exactly two legs between six. 
Nevertheless, these valiant artillerists took no particular account of these little facts, and felt justly proud when the dispatches of a battle returned the number of victims at tenfold the quantity of the projectiles expended. One day, however, sad and melancholy day, peace was signed between the survivors of the war. The thunder of the guns gradually ceased. The mortars were silent. The howitzers were muzzled for an indefinite period. The cannon, with muzzles depressed, were returned into the arsenal. The shot were repiled. All bloody reminiscences were effaced. The cotton plants grew luxuriantly in the well-manured fields. All morning garments were laid aside, together with grief, and the gun club was relegated to profound inactivity. Some few of the more advanced and inveterate theorists set themselves again to work upon calculations regarding the laws of projectiles. They reverted invariably to gigantic shells and howitzers of unparalleled caliber. Still, in default of practical experience, what was the value of mere theories? Consequently, the club rooms became deserted. The servants dozed in the antechambers. The newspapers grew mouldy on the tables. Sounds of snoring came from dark corners, and the members of the gun club, erstwhile so noisy in their seances, were reduced to silence by this disastrous peace, and gave themselves up wholly to dreams of a platonic kind of artillery. "'This is horrible,' said Tom Hunter one evening, while rapidly carbonizing his wooden legs in the fireplace of the smoking-room. "'Nothing to do! Nothing to look forward to!' What a loathsome existence! When again shall the guns arouse us in the morning with their delightful reports? Those days are gone by, said Jolly Billsby, trying to extend his missing arms. It was delightful once upon a time. One invented a gun, and hardly was it cast, when one hastened to try it in the face of the enemy. Then one returned to camp with a word of encouragement from Sherman, or a friendly shake of the hand from McClellan. But now the generals are gone back to their counters, and in place of projectiles they dispatch bales of cotton. By Jove, the future of gunnery in America is lost! I had no war in prospect, continued the famous James T. Maston, scratching with his steel hook his gutta-percha cranium. Not a cloud in the horizon, and that, too, at such a critical period in the progress of the science of artillery. Yes, gentlemen, I who address you have myself this very morning perfected a model, plan, section, elevation, etc., of a mortar destined to change all the conditions of warfare. No, is it possible? replied Tom Hunter his thoughts reverting involuntarily to a former invention of the Honourable J. T. Maston, by which, at its first trial, he had succeeded in killing three hundred and thirty-seven people. "'Fact,' replied he. "'Still, what is the use of so many studies worked out, so many difficulties vanquished? It's mere waste of time. The new world seems to have made up its mind to live in peace.' and our bellicose tribune predicts some approaching catastrophes arising out of this scandalous increase of population. Uh, nevertheless, replied Colonel Blomsberry, there are always struggling in Europe to maintain the principles of nationalities. Well, well, there might be some field for enterprise down there, and if they would accept our services— What are you dreaming of? screamed Billsby work a gunnery for the benefit of foreigners. That would be better than doing nothing here, returned the colonel. Quite so, said J.T. Maston, but still we need not dream of that expedient. And why not? demanded the colonel. Because their ideas of progress in the old world are contrary to our American habits of thought. Those fellows believe that one can't become a general without having served first as an ensign, which is as much as to say that one can't point a gun without having first cast it oneself. Ridiculous, replied Tom Hunter, whittling with his bowie knife the arms of his easy chair. 
but if that be the case there all that is left for us is to plant tobacco and distill whale oil what roared j t maston shall we not employ these remaining years of our life in perfecting firearms shall there never be a fresh opportunity of trying the ranges of projectiles shall the air never again be lighted with the glare of our guns no international difficulty ever arise to enable us to declare war against some transatlantic power shall not the french sink one of our steamers or the english in defiance of the rights of nations hang a few of our countrymen no such luck replied colonel blomsbury nothing of the kind is likely to happen and even if it did we should not profit by it american susceptibility is fast declining and we are all going to the dogs it is too true replied j t maston with fresh violence there are a thousand grounds for fighting and yet we don't fight we save up our arms and legs for the benefit of nations who don't know what to do with them but stop without going out of one's way to find a cause for war did not north america once belong to the english undoubtedly replied tom hunter stamping his crutch with fury well then replied j t maston why should not england in her turn belong to the americans it would be but just and fair returned colonel blomsbury go and propose it to the president of the united states cried j t maston and see how he will receive you bah growled billsby between the four teeth which the war had left him that will never do by jove cried j t maston he mustn't count on my vote at the next election nor on ours replied unanimously all the bellicose invalids meanwhile replied j t m allow me to say that if i cannot get an opportunity to try my new mortars on a real field of battle i shall say good-bye to the members of the gun club and go and bury myself in the prairies of arkansas in that case we will accompany you cried the others matters were in this unfortunate condition and the club was threatened with approaching dissolution when an unexpected circumstance occurred to prevent so deplorable a catastrophe on the morrow after this conversation every member of the association received a sealed circular couched in the following terms baltimore october third the president of the gun club has the honor to inform his colleagues that at the meeting of the fifth instant he will bring before them a communication of an extremely interesting nature he requests therefore that they will make it convenient to attend in accordance with the present invitation very cordially M. P. Barbicane, P. G. C. End of chapter. Chapter Two, President Barbicane's communication. On the fifth of October, at eight p.m., a dense crowd pressed towards the saloons of the Gun Club at Number Twenty One Union Square. All the members of the association resident in Baltimore attended the invitation of their president. As regards the corresponding members, notices were delivered by hundreds throughout the streets of the city, and large as was the great hall, it was quite inadequate to accommodate the crowd of savants. They overflowed into the adjoining rooms, down the narrow passages, into the outer courtyards. There they ran against the vulgar herd who pressed up to the doors, each struggling to reach the front ranks all eager to learn the nature of the important communication of president barbicane all pushing squeezing crushing with that perfect freedom of action which is peculiar to the masses when educated in ideas of self-government on that evening a stranger who might have chanced to be in baltimore could not have gained admission for love or money into the great hall that was reserved exclusively for resident or corresponding members no one else could possibly have obtained a place, and the city magnates, municipal councillors, and select men were compelled to mingle with the mere townspeople in order to catch stray bits of news from the interior. Nevertheless, the vast hall presented a curious spectacle. Its immense area was singularly adapted to the purpose. 
lofty pillars formed of cannon, superposed upon huge mortars as a base, supported the fine ironwork of the arches, a perfect piece of cast-iron lacework. Trophies of blunderbusses, matchlocks, arquebuses, carbines, all kinds of firearms, ancient and modern, were picturesquely interlaced against the walls. The gas lit up in full glare, myriads of revolvers grouped in the form of lusters, while groups of pistols and candelabra formed of muskets bound together, completed this magnificent display of brilliance. Models of cannon, bronze castings, sights covered with dents, plates battered by the shots of the gun-club, assortments of rammers and sponges, chaplets of shells, wreaths of projectiles, garlands of howitzers, in short, all the apparatus of the artillerist, enchanted the eye by this wonderful arrangement, and induced a kind of belief that their real purpose was ornamental, rather than deadly. At the further end of the saloon the President, assisted by four secretaries, occupied a large platform. His chair, supported by a carved gun carriage, was modelled upon the ponderous proportions of a thirty-two-inch mortar. It was pointed at an angle of ninety degrees, and suspended upon trunnions, so that the President could balance himself upon it as upon a rocking-chair, a very agreeable fact in the very hot weather. Upon the table, a huge iron plate supported upon six carronades, stood an inkstand of exquisite elegance, made of a beautifully chased Spanish piece, and a sonnet, which, when required, could give forth a report equal to that of a revolver. During violent debates this novel kind of bell scarcely sufficed to drown the clamour of these excitable artillerists. In front of the table benches arranged in zigzag form, like the circumvallations of a retrenchment, formed a succession of bastions and curtains set apart for the use of the members of the club and on this especial evening one might say, all the world was on the ramparts. The President was sufficiently well known, however, for all to be assured that he would not put his colleagues to discomfort without some very strong motive. Impey Barbicane was a man of forty years of age, calm, cold, austere, of a singularly serious and self-contained demeanour, punctual as a chronometer of imperturbable temper and immovable character, by no means chivalrous, yet adventurous withal, and always bringing practical ideas to bear upon the very rashest enterprises, an essentially New Englander, a northern colonist, a descendant of the old anti-Stuart roundheads, and the implacable enemy of the gentlemen of the South, those ancient cavaliers of the mother country. In a word, he was a Yankee to the backbone. Barbicane had made a large fortune as a timber merchant. Being nominated director of artillery during the war, he proved himself fertile in invention. Bold in his conceptions, he contributed powerfully to the progress of that arm, and gave an immense impetus to experimental researches. He was a personage of the middle height, having, by a rare exception in the gun club, all his limbs complete. His strongly marked features seem drawn by square and rule, and if it be true that, in order to judge of a man's character, one must look at his profile, Barbicane, so examined, exhibited the most certain indications of energy, audacity, and sang-froid. At this moment he was sitting in his armchair, silent, absorbed, lost in reflection, sheltered under his high-crowned hat, a kind of black silk cylinder which always seemed firmly screwed upon the head of an American. Just when the deep-toned clock in the great hall struck eight, Barbicane, as if he had been set in motion by a spring, raised himself up. A profound silence ensued, and the speaker, in his somewhat emphatic tone of voice, commenced as follows. "'My brave colleagues,' Too long already a paralyzing peace has plunged the members of the gun club in deplorable inactivity. After a period of years full of incidents, we have been compelled to abandon our labors, and to stop short on the road of progress. I do not hesitate to state, boldly, 
that any war which should recall us to arms would be welcome. There was tremendous applause. But war, gentlemen, is impossible under existing circumstances, and however we may desire it, many years may elapse before our cannon shall again thunder in the field of battle. We must make up our minds, then, to seek in another train of ideas some field for the activity which we all pine for. The meeting felt that the President was now approaching the critical point, and redoubled their attention accordingly. "'For some months past, my brave colleagues,' continued Barbicane, "'I have been asking myself whether, while confining ourselves to our own particular objects, we could not enter upon some grand experiment worthy of the nineteenth century, and whether the progress of artillery science would not enable us to carry it out to a successful issue. I have been considering, working, calculating, and the result of my studies is the conviction that we are safe to succeed in an enterprise which to any other country would appear wholly impracticable. This project, the result of long elaboration, is the object of my present communication. It is worthy of yourselves, worthy of the antecedents of the gun club, and it cannot fail to make some noise in the world. A thrill of excitement ran through the meeting. Barbicane, having by a rapid movement firmly fixed his hat upon his head, calmly continued his harangue. There is no one among you, my brave colleagues, who has not seen the moon, or at least heard speak of it. Don't be surprised if I am about to discourse to you regarding this queen of the night. It is perhaps reserved for us to become the Columbuses of this unknown world. Only enter into my plans, and second me with all your power, and I will lead you to its conquest, and its name shall be added to those of the thirty-six states which compose this great union. Three cheers for the moon! roared the gun club with one voice. The moon, gentlemen, has been carefully studied, continued Barbicane. Her mass, density, and weight, her constitution, motions, distance, as well as her place in the solar system, have all been exactly determined. Selenographic charts have been constructed with a perfection which equals, if it does not even surpass, that of our terrestrial maps. Photography has given us proofs of the incomparable beauty of our satellite. In short, all is known regarding the moon which mathematical science, astronomy, geology, and optics can learn about her. But up to the present moment no direct communication has been established with her. A violent movement of interest and surprise here greeted this remark of the speaker. "'Permit me,' he continued, "'to recount to you briefly how certain ardent spirits, starting on imaginary journeys, have penetrated the secrets of our satellite. In the seventeenth century, a certain David Fabricius boasted of having seen with his own eyes the inhabitants of the moon. In 1649, a Frenchman, one Jean Baudouin, published a journey performed from the earth to the moon by Domingo Gonzalez, a Spanish adventurer. At the same period, Cyrano de Bergerac published that celebrated Journeys in the Moon, which met with such success in France. Somewhat later another Frenchman, named Fontenelle, wrote The Plurality of Worlds, a chef d'oeuvre of its time. About 1835 a small treatise, translated from the New York American, related how Sir John Herschel, having been dispatched to the Cape of Good Hope for the purpose of making there some astronomical calculations, had by means of a telescope brought to perfection by means of internal lighting, reduced the apparent distance of the moon to eighty yards. He then distinctly perceived caverns frequented by hippopotami, green mountains bordered by golden lacework, sheep with horns of ivory, a white species of deer, and inhabitants with membranous wings like bats. This brochure, the work of an American named Locke, had a great sale. But, to bring this rapid sketch to a close, I will only add that a certain Hans Fall of Rotterdam, launching himself in a balloon filled with a gas extracted from nitrogen, 
37 times lighter than hydrogen, reached the moon after a passage of 19 hours. This journey, like all the previous ones, was purely imaginary. Still, it was the work of a popular American author. I mean Edgar Poe. "'Cheers for Edgar Poe!' roared the assemblage, electrified by their president's words. "'I have now enumerated,' said Barbicane, "'the experiments which I call purely paper ones, and wholly insufficient to establish serious relations with the Queen of Night. Nevertheless, I am bound to add that some practical geniuses have attempted to establish actual communication with her. Thus, a few years ago, a German geometrician proposed to send a scientific expedition to the steppes of Siberia. There, on those vast plains, they were to describe enormous geometric figures, drawn in characters of reflecting luminosity, amongst which was the proposition regarding the square of the hypothenuse, commonly called the ass's bridge by the French. Every intelligent being, said the geometrician, must understand the scientific meaning of that figure. The Selenites, do they exist, will respond by a similar figure, and, a communication being thus once established, it will be easy to form an alphabet which shall enable us to converse with the inhabitants of the moon. So spoke the German geometrician, but his project was never put into practice, and up to the present day there is no bond in existence between the earth and her satellite. It is reserved for the practical genius of Americans to establish a communication with the sidereal world. The means of arriving thither are simple, easy, certain, infallible, and that is the purpose of my present proposal. A storm of acclamations greeted these words. There was not a single person in the whole audience who was not overcome, carried away, lifted out of himself by the speaker's words. Long-continued applause resounded from all sides. As soon as the excitement had partially subsided, Barbicane resumed his speech in a somewhat graver voice. "'You know,' said he, "'what progress artillery science has made during the last few years, and what a degree of perfection firearms of every kind have reached. Moreover, you are well aware that in general terms the resisting power of cannon— and the expensive force of gunpowder are practically unlimited. Well, starting from this principle, I ask myself whether, supposing sufficient apparatus could be obtained, constructed upon the conditions of ascertained resistance, it might not be possible to project a shot up to the moon? At these words a murmur of amazement escaped from a thousand panting chests, then succeeded a moment of perfect silence, resembling that profound stillness which precedes the bursting of a thunderstorm. In point of fact, a thunderstorm did peal forth, but it was the thunder of applause, of cries, and of uproar which made the very hall tremble. The president attempted to speak, but could not. It was fully ten minutes before he could make himself heard. Suffer me to finish he calmly continued. I have looked at the question in all its bearings. I have resolutely attacked it, and by incontrovertible calculations, I find that a projectile, endowed with an initial velocity of twelve thousand yards per second, and aimed at the moon, must necessarily reach it. I have the honour, my brave colleagues, to propose a trial of this little experiment. End of chapter Chapter 3. Effect of the President's Communication It is impossible to describe the effect produced by the last words of the Honorable President, the cries, the shouts, the succession of roars, hurrahs, and all the varied vociferations which the American language is capable of supplying. It was a scene of indescribable confusion and uproar. They shouted, they clapped, they stamped on the floor of the hall. All the weapons in the museum discharged at once could not have more violently set in motion the waves of sound. One need not be surprised at this. There are some cannoneers nearly as noisy as their own guns. 
Barbicane remained calm in the midst of this enthusiastic clamour. Perhaps he was desirous of addressing a few more words to his colleagues, for by his gestures he demanded silence, and his powerful alarm was worn out by its violent reports. No attention, however, was paid to his request. He was presently torn from his seat, and passed from the hands of his faithful colleagues into the arms of a no less excited crowd. Nothing can astound an American. It has often been asserted that the word impossible is not a French one. People have evidently been deceived by the dictionary. In America all is easy, all is simple, and as for mechanical difficulties, they are overcome before they arise. Between Barbicane's proposition and its realization, no true Yankee would have allowed even the semblance of a difficulty to be possible. A thing with them is no sooner said than done. The triumphal progress of the President continued throughout the evening. It was a regular torchlight procession. Irish, Germans, French, Scotch, all the heterogeneous units which make up the population of Maryland, shouted in their respective vernaculars, and the vivas, hurrahs, and bravos were intermingled in an inexpressible enthusiasm. Just at this crisis, as though she comprehended all this agitation regarding herself, the moon shone forth with serene splendour, eclipsing by her intense illumination all the surrounding lights. The Yankees all turned their gaze towards her resplendent orb, kissed their hands, called her by all kinds of endearing names. Between eight o'clock and midnight, one optician in Jones Fall Street made his fortune by the sale of opera glasses. Midnight arrived, and the enthusiasm showed no signs of diminution. It spread equally among all classes of citizens, men of science, shopkeepers, merchants, porters, chairmen, as well as greenhorns, were stirred in their innermost fibres. A national enterprise was at stake. The whole city, high and low, the keys bordering the Patapsco, the ships lying in the basins, disgorged a crowd drunk with joy, gin, and whiskey. Everyone chattered, argued, discussed, disputed, applauded, from the gentleman lounging upon the barroom settee with his tumbler of sherry cobbler before him, down to the waterman who got drunk upon his knock-me-down in the dingy taverns of Fell Point. About 2 a.m., however, the excitement began to subside. President Barbicane reached his house, bruised, crushed, and squeezed almost to a mummy. A Hercules could not have resisted a similar outbreak of enthusiasm. The crowd gradually deserted the squares and streets. The four railways from Philadelphia and Washington, Harrisburg and Wheeling, which converge at Baltimore, whirled away the heterogeneous population to the four corners of the United States, and the city subsided into comparative tranquillity. On the following day, thanks to the telegraphic wires, five hundred newspapers and journals, daily, weekly, monthly, or bi-monthly, all took up the question. They examined it under all its different aspects, physical, meteorological, economical, or moral, up to its bearings on politics or civilization. They debated whether the moon was a finished world, or whether it was destined to undergo any further transformation. Did it resemble the earth at the period when the latter was destitute as yet of an atmosphere? What kind of spectacle would its hidden hemisphere present to our terrestrial spheroid? Granting that the question at present was simply that of sending a projectile up to the moon, every one must see that that involved the commencement of a series of experiments. All must hope that some day America would penetrate the deepest secrets of that mysterious orb, and some even seemed to fear lest its conquest should not sensibly derange the equilibrium of Europe. The project once under discussion, not a single paragraph suggested a doubt of its realization. All the papers, pamphlets, reports, all the journals published by the scientific, literary, and religious societies enlarged upon its advantages, and the Society of Natural History of Boston, the Society of Science and Art of Albany, 
the Geographical and Statistical Society of New York, the Philosophical Society of Philadelphia, and the Smithsonian of Washington sent innumerable letters of congratulations to the Gun Club, together with offers of immediate assistance and money. From that day forward, Impey Barbicane became one of the greatest citizens of the United States, a kind of Washington of science. A single trait of feeling, taken from many others, will serve to show the point which this homage of a whole people to a single individual attained. Some few days after this memorable meeting of the Gun Club, the manager of an English company announced, at the Baltimore Theatre, the production of Much Ado About Nothing. But the populace, seeing in that title an allusion damaging to Barbicane's project, broke into the auditorium, smashed the benches, and compelled the unlucky director to alter his playbill. Being a sensible man, he bowed to the public will and replaced the offending comedy by As You Like It, and for many weeks he realized fabulous profits. End of chapter. Chapter 4. Reply from the Observatory of Cambridge. Barbicane, however, lost not one moment amidst all the enthusiasm of which he had become the object. His first care was to reassemble his colleagues in the boardroom of the gun club. There, after some discussion, it was agreed to consult the astronomers regarding the astronomical part of the enterprise. Their reply once ascertained, they could then discuss the mechanical means, and nothing should be wanting to ensure the success of this great experiment. A note couched in precise terms, containing special interrogatories, was then drawn up and addressed to the Observatory of Cambridge in Massachusetts. This city, where the first university of the United States was founded, is justly celebrated for its astronomical staff. There are to be found assembled all the most eminent men of science. Here is to be seen at work that powerful telescope which enabled Bond to resolve the nebula of Andromeda, and Clark to discover the satellite of Sirius. This celebrated institution fully justified on all points the confidence reposed in it by the gun club. So after two days, the reply so impatiently awaited was placed in the hands of President Barbicane. It was couched in the following terms. The director of the Cambridge Observatory to the president of the Gun Club at Baltimore. From Cambridge, October 7. On the receipt of your favor of the 6th instant, addressed to the Observatory of Cambridge in the name of the members of the Baltimore Gun Club, our staff was immediately called together, and it was judged expedient to reply as follows. The questions which have been proposed to it are these. 1. Is it possible to transmit a projectile up to the moon? 2. What is the exact distance which separates the Earth from its satellite? 3. What will be the period of transit of the projectile when endowed with sufficient initial velocity? And consequently, at what moment ought it to be discharged in order that it may touch the moon at a particular point? 4. At what precise moment will the moon present herself in the most favorable position to be reached by the projectile? 5. What point in the heavens ought the cannon to be aimed at which is intended to discharge the projectile? 6. What place will the moon occupy in the heavens at the moment of the projectile's departure? Regarding the first question, is it possible to transmit a projectile up to the moon? Answer. Yes, provided it possess an initial velocity of 1,200 yards per second. Calculations prove that to be sufficient. In proportion as we recede from the earth, the action of gravitation diminishes in the inverse ratio of the square of the distance. That is to say, at three times a given distance, the action is nine times less. Consequently, the weight of a shot will decrease and will become reduced to zero at the instant that the attraction of the moon exactly counterpoises that of the earth, that is to say, at 47.50 seconds of its passage. 
At that instant the projectile will have no weight whatever, and if it passes that point, it will fall into the moon by the sole effect of the lunar attraction. The theoretical possibility of the experiment is therefore absolutely demonstrated. Its success must depend upon the power of the engine employed. As to the second question, what is the exact distance which separates the Earth from its satellite? Answer. The moon does not describe a circle round the Earth, but rather an ellipse, of which our Earth occupies one of the foci. The consequence, therefore, is that at certain times it approaches nearer to, and at other times it recedes farther from, the Earth. In astronomical language it is at one time in apogee, at another in perigee. Now the difference between its greatest and its least distance is too considerable to be left out of consideration. In point of fact, in its apogee, the moon is 247,552 miles, and in its perigee, 218,657 miles only distant, a fact which makes a difference of 28,895 miles or more than one-ninth of the entire distance. The perigee distance, therefore, is that which ought to serve as the basis of all calculations. To the third question. Answer. If the shot should preserve continuously its initial velocity of 12,000 yards per second, it would require little more than nine hours to reach its destination. But, Inasmuch as that initial velocity will be continually decreasing, it results that, taking everything into consideration, it will occupy 300,000 seconds, that is, 83 hours 20 minutes, in reaching the point where the attraction of the earth and moon will be in equilibrio. From this point it will fall into the moon in 50,000 seconds, or 13 hours, 53 minutes, 20 seconds. It will be desirable, therefore, to discharge it 97 hours, 13 minutes, 20 seconds before the arrival of the moon at the point aimed at. Regarding question 4, at what precise moment will the moon present herself in the most favorable position, etc.? Answer. After what has been said above, it will be necessary, first of all, to choose the period when the moon will be in perigee, and also the moment when she will be crossing the zenith, which latter event will further diminish the entire distance by a length equal to the radius of the earth, i.e., 3,919 miles, the result of which will be that the final passage remaining to be accomplished will be 214,000 miles. 976 miles. But although the moon passes her perigee every month, she does not reach the zenith always at exactly the same moment. She does not appear under these two conditions simultaneously, except at long intervals of time. It will be necessary, therefore, to wait for the moment when her passage in perigee shall coincide with that in the zenith. Now, by a fortunate circumstance, on the 4th December in the ensuing year, the moon will present these two conditions. At midnight she will be in perigee, that is, at her shortest distance from the earth, and at the same moment she will be crossing the zenith. On the fifth question, at what point in the heavens ought the cannon to be aimed? Answer. The preceding remarks being admitted, the cannon ought to be pointed to the zenith of the place. Its fire, therefore, will be perpendicular to the plane of the horizon, and the projectile will soonest pass beyond the range of the terrestrial attraction. But, in order that the moon should reach the zenith of a given place, it is necessary that the place should not exceed in latitude the declination of the luminary. In other words, it must be comprised within the degrees zero and twenty-eight degrees of latitude north or south. In every other spot, the fire must necessarily be oblique, which would seriously militate against the success of the experiment. As to the sixth question, what place will the moon occupy in the heavens at the moment of the projectile's departure? 
Answer. At the moment when the projectile shall be discharged into space, the moon, which travels daily forward, 13 degrees, 10 minutes, 35 seconds, will be distant from the zenith point by four times that quantity, i.e., by 52 degrees, 42 minutes, 20 seconds, a space which corresponds to the path which she will describe during the entire journey of the projectile. But, inasmuch as it is equally necessary to take into account the deviation which the rotary motion of the earth will impart to the shot, and as the shot cannot reach the moon until after a deviation equal to sixteen radii of the earth, which, calculated upon the moon's orbit, are equal to about eleven degrees, it becomes necessary to add these eleven degrees to those which express the retardation of the moon just mentioned. That is to say, in round numbers, about sixty-four degrees. Consequently, at the moment of firing, the visual radius applied to the moon will describe, with the vertical line of the place, an angle of sixty-four degrees. These are our answers to the questions proposed to the Observatory of Cambridge by the members of the Gun Club. To sum up, first, the cannon ought to be planted in a country situated between zero and twenty-eight degrees of north or south latitude. Secondly, it ought to be pointed directly towards the zenith of the place. Thirdly, the projectile ought to be propelled with an initial velocity of 12,000 yards per second. Fourthly, it ought to be discharged at 10 hours, 46 minutes, 40 seconds of the 1st December of the ensuing year. Fifthly, it will meet the moon four days after its discharge, precisely at midnight on the 4th December, at the moment of its transit across the zenith. The members of the Gun Club ought, therefore, without delay, to commence the works necessary for such an experiment, and to be prepared to set to work at the moment determined upon, for, if they should suffer this 4th December to go by, they will not find the moon again under the same conditions of perigee and of zenith until eighteen years and eleven days afterwards. The staff of the Cambridge Observatory placed themselves entirely at their disposal, in respect of all questions of theoretical astronomy, and herewith add their congratulations to those of all the rest of America. For the Astronomical Staff, J. M. Belfast, Director of the Observatory of Cambridge. End of chapter. Chapter 5. The Romance of the Moon an observer endued with his infinite range of vision, and placed in that unknown centre around which the entire world revolves, might have beheld myriads of atoms filling all space during the chaotic epoch of the universe. Little by little, as ages went on, a change took place. A general law of attraction manifested itself, to which the hitherto errant atoms became obedient. These atoms combined together chemically according to their affinities, formed themselves into molecules, and composed those nebulous masses with which the depths of the heavens are strewed. These masses became immediately endued with a rotary motion around their own central point. This center, formed of indefinite molecules, began to revolve around its own axis during its gradual condensation. Then, following the immutable laws of mechanics, in proportion as its bulk diminished by condensation, its rotary motion became accelerated, and these two effects continuing, the result was the formation of one principal star, the center of the nebulous mass. By attentively watching, the observer would then have perceived the other molecules of the mass, following the example of this central star, become likewise condensed by gradually accelerated rotation, and gravitating round it in the shape of innumerable stars. Thus was formed the nebulae, of which astronomers have reckoned up nearly five thousand. Amongst these five thousand nebulae there is one which has received the name of the Milky Way, and which contains eighteen millions of stars, each of which has become the centre of a solar world. 
if the observer had then specially directed his attention to one of the more humble and less brilliant of these stellar bodies a star of the fourth class that which is arrogantly called the sun all the phenomena to which the formation of the universe is to be ascribed would have been successfully fulfilled before his eyes in fact he would have perceived this sun as yet in the gaseous state and composed of moving molecules revolving round its axis in order to accomplish its work of concentration this motion faithful to the laws of mechanics would have been accelerated with the diminution of its volume and a moment would have arrived when the centrifugal force would have overpowered the centripetal which causes the molecules all to tend towards the centre another phenomenon would now have passed before the observer's eye and the molecules situated on the plane of the equator escaping like a stone from a sling of which the cord had suddenly snapped would have formed around the sun sundry concentric rings resembling that of saturn in their turn again these rings of cosmical matter excited by a rotary motion round the central mass would have been broken up and decomposed into secondary nebulosities that is to say into planets similarly he would have observed these planets throw off one or more rings each which became the origin of the secondary bodies which we call satellites thus then advancing from atom to molecule from molecule to nebulous mass from that to a principal star from star to sun from sun to planet and hence to satellite we have the whole series of transformations undergone by the heavenly bodies during the first days of the world now of those attendant bodies which the sun maintains in their elliptical orbits by the great law of gravitation some few in their turn possess satellites uranus has eight saturn eight jupiter four neptune possibly three and the earth one this last one of the least important of the entire solar system we call the moon and it is she whom the daring genius of the americans professed their intention of conquering the moon by her comparative proximity and the constantly varying appearances produced by her several phases has always occupied a considerable share of the attention of the inhabitants of the earth from the time of thales of miletus in the fifth century b c down to that of copernicus in the fifteenth and tycho brahe in the sixteenth century a d observations have been from time to time carried on with more or less correctness until in the present day the altitudes of the lunar mountains have been determined with exactitude galileo explained the phenomena of the lunar light produced during certain hover phases by the existence of mountains to which he assigned a mean altitude of twenty seven thousand feet after him hevelius an astronomer of Danzig, reduced the highest elevations to fifteen thousand feet but the calculations of riccioli brought them up again to twenty one thousand feet at the close of the eighteenth century herschel armed with a powerful telescope considerably reduced the preceding measurements he assigned a height of eleven thousand four hundred feet to the maximum elevations and reduced the mean of the different altitudes to little more than twenty four hundred feet but herschel's calculations were in their turn corrected by the observations of halley naismith bianchini rithoysen and others but it was reserved for the labors of boer and of medler finally to solve the question they succeeded in measuring one thousand nine hundred and five different elevations of which six exceeded fifteen thousand feet and twenty-two exceed fourteen thousand four hundred feet the highest summit of all towers to a height of twenty two thousand six hundred six feet above the surface of the lunar disk at the same period the examination of the moon was completed she appeared completely riddled with craters and her essentially volcanic character was apparent at each observation by the absence of refraction in the rays of the planets occulted by her 
we conclude that she is absolutely devoid of an atmosphere. The absence of air entails the absence of water. It became, therefore, manifest that the selenites, to support life under such conditions, must possess a special organization of their own, must differ remarkably from the inhabitants of the earth. At length, thanks to modern art, instruments of still higher perfection searched the moon without intermission, not leaving a single point of her surface unexplored, and notwithstanding that her diameter measures 2150 miles, her surface equals one-fifteenth part of that of our globe, and her bulk the one-forty-ninth part of that of the terrestrial spheroid, not one of her secrets was able to escape the eyes of the astronomers, and these skilful men of science carried to even greater degree their prodigious observations. Thus they remark that, during full moon, the disk appeared scored in certain parts with white lines, and, during the phases, with black. On prosecuting the study of these with still greater precision, they succeeded in obtaining an exact account of the nature of these lines. They were long and narrow furrows sunk between parallel ridges, bordering generally upon the edges of the craters. Their length varied between ten and one hundred miles, and their width was about sixteen hundred yards. Astronomers called them chasms, but they could not get any farther. Whether these chasms were the dried-up beds of ancient rivers or not, they were unable thoroughly to ascertain. The Americans, amongst others, hoped one day or other to determine this geological question. They also undertook to examine the true nature of that system of parallel ramparts discovered on the moon's surface by Grithersen, a learned professor of Munich, who considered them to be a system of fortifications thrown up by the Selenitic engineers. These two points, yet obscure, as well as others, no doubt, could not be definitively settled except by direct communication with the moon. Regarding the degree of intensity of its light, there was nothing more to learn on this point. It was known that it is 300,000 times weaker than that of the sun, and that its heat has no appreciable effect upon the thermometer. As to the phenomenon known as the ashy light, it is explained naturally by the effect of the transmission of the solar rays from the earth to the moon, which give the appearance of completeness to the lunar disk, while it presents itself under the crescent form, during its first and last phases. Such was the state of knowledge acquired regarding the earth's satellite, which the Gun Club undertook to perfect in all its aspects, cosmographic, geological, political, and moral. End of chapter. Chapter 6. The Permissive Limits of Ignorance and Belief in the United States the immediate result of Barbicane's proposition was to place upon the orders of the day all the astronomical facts relative to the Queen of Night. Everybody set to work to study assiduously. One would have thought that the moon had just appeared for the first time, and that no one had ever before caught a glimpse of her in the heavens. The papers revived all the old anecdotes in which the Son of the Wolves played a part. They recalled the influences which the ignorance of past ages ascribed to her. In short, all America was seized with selenomania, or had become moon-mad. The scientific journals, for their part, dealt more especially with the questions which touched upon the enterprise of the Gun Club. The letter of the Observatory of Cambridge was published by them, and commented upon with unreserved approval. Until that time most people had been ignorant of the mode in which the distance which separates the moon from the earth is calculated. They took advantage of this fact to explain to them that this distance was obtained by measuring the parallax of the moon, the term parallax proving caviar to the general. They further explained that it meant the angle formed by the inclination of two straight lines drawn from either extremity of the earth's radius to the moon. 
On doubts being expressed as to the correctness of this method, they immediately proved that not only was the mean distance 234,347 miles, but that astronomers could not possibly be in error in their estimate by more than 70 miles either way. To those who were not familiar with the motions of the moon, they demonstrated that she possesses two distinct motions, the first being that of rotation upon her axis, the second that of revolution round the earth, accomplishing both together in an equal period of time, that is to say, in twenty-seven and one-third days. The motion of rotation is that which produces day and night on the surface of the moon save that there is only one day and one night in the lunar month, each lasting three hundred fifty-four and one-third hours. But happily for her, the face turned towards the terrestrial globe is illuminated by it with an intensity equal to the light of fourteen moons. As to the other face, always invisible to us, it has of necessity three hundred fifty-four hours of absolute night, tempered only by that pale glimmer which falls upon it from the stars. Some well-intentioned but rather obstinate persons could not at first comprehend how, if the moon displays invariably the same face to the earth during her revolution, she can describe one turn round herself. To such they answered, "'Go into your dining-room, and walk round the table in such a way as always to keep your face turned towards the centre. By the time you will have achieved one complete round, you will have completed one turn round yourself, since your eye will have travelled successively every point of the room. Well, then, the room is the heavens, the table is the earth, and the moon is yourself. And they would go away delighted. So, then, the moon displays invariably the same face to the earth. Nevertheless, to be quite exact, it is necessary to add that, in consequence of certain fluctuations of north and south, and of west and east, termed her libration, she permits rather more than the half, that is to say, five-sevenths, to be seen. As soon as the ignoramuses came to understand as much as the director of the observatory himself knew, they began to worry themselves regarding her revolution round the earth whereupon twenty scientific reviews immediately came to the rescue. They pointed out to them then that the firmament, with its infinitude of stars, may be considered as one vast dial-plate upon which the moon travels, indicating the true time to all the inhabitants of the earth. That is, during this movement that the Queen of Night exhibits her different phases, that the moon is full when she is in opposition with the sun, that is, when the three bodies are in the same straight line, the earth occupying the center, that she is new when she is in conjunction with the sun, that is, when she is between it and the earth, and lastly, that she is in her first or last quarter, when she makes with the sun and the earth an angle of which she herself occupies the apex. Regarding the altitude which the moon attains above the horizon, the letter of the Cambridge Observatory had said all that was to be said in that respect. Everyone knew that this altitude varies according to the latitude of the observer, but the only zones of the globe in which the moon passes the zenith, that is, the point directly over the head of the spectator, are of necessity comprised between the twenty-eighth parallels and the equator. Hence the importance of the advice to try the experiment upon some point of that part of the globe, in order that the projectile might be discharged perpendicularly, and so the soonest escape the action of gravitation. This was an essential condition to the success of the enterprise, and continued actively to engage the public attention. Regarding the path described by the moon in a revolution round the earth, the Cambridge Observatory had demonstrated that this path is a re-entering curve, not a perfect circle, but an ellipse, of which the Earth occupies one of the foci. It was also well understood that it is farthest removed from the Earth during its apogee, 
and approaches most nearly to it at its perigee. Such, then, was the extent of knowledge possessed by every American on the subject, and of which no one could decently profess ignorance. Still, while these true principles were being rapidly disseminated, many errors and illusory fears proved less easy to eradicate. For instance, some worthy persons maintain that the moon was an ancient comet, which, in describing its elongated orbit round the sun, happened to pass near the earth and became confined within her circle of attraction. These drawing-room astronomers profess so to explain the charred aspect of the moon, a disaster which they attributed to the intensity of the solar heat. Only, on being reminded that comets have an atmosphere, and that the moon has little or none, they were fairly at a loss for a reply. Others again, belonging to the doubting class, express certain fears as to the position of the moon. They had heard it said that, according to observations made in the time of the caliphs, her revolution had become accelerated in a certain degree. Hence they concluded, logically enough, that an acceleration of motion ought to be accompanied by a corresponding diminution in the distance separating the two bodies, and that, supposing the double effect to be continued to infinity, the moon would end by one day falling into the earth. However, they became reassured as to the fate of future generations on being apprised that, according to the calculations of Laplace, this acceleration of motion is confined within very restricted limits, and that a proportional diminution of speed will be certain to succeed it. So, then, the stability of the solar system would not be deranged in ages to come. There remains but the third class, the superstitious. These worthies were not content merely to rest in ignorance. They must know all about things which had no existence whatever. And as to the moon, they had long known all about her. One set regarded her disk as a polished mirror by means of which people could see each other from different points of the earth, and interchange their thoughts. Another set pretended that out of one thousand new moons that had been observed, nine hundred and fifty had been attended with remarkable disturbances, such as cataclysms, revolutions, earthquakes, the deluge, etc. Then they believed in some mysterious influence exercised by her over human destinies, that every selenite was attached to some inhabitant of the earth by a tie of sympathy. They maintain that the entire vital system is subject to her control, etc., etc. But in time the majority renounced these vulgar errors, and espoused the true side of the question. As for the Yankees, they had no other ambition than to take possession of this new continent of the sky, and to plant upon the summit of its highest elevation the star-spangled banner of the United States of America. End of chapter. Chapter 7. The Hymn of the Cannonball The Observatory of Cambridge in its memorable letter had treated the question from a purely astronomical point of view. The mechanical part still remained. President Barbicane had, without loss of time, nominated a working committee of the Gun Club. The duty of this committee was to resolve the three grand questions of the cannon, the projectile, and the powder. It was composed of four members of great technical knowledge, Barbicane, with a casting vote in case of equality, General Morgan, Major Elphinstone, and J. T. Maston, to whom were confided the functions of a secretary. On the 8th of October, the committee met at the house of President Barbicane, 3 Republican Street. The meeting was opened by the President himself. Gentlemen, said he, we have to resolve one of the most important problems in the whole of the noble science of gunnery. It might appear, perhaps, the most logical course to devote our first meeting to the discussion of the engine to be employed. Nevertheless, after mature consideration, 
it has appeared to me that the question of the projectile must take precedence of that of the cannon, and that the dimensions of the latter must necessarily depend upon those of the former. "'Suffer me to say a word,' here broke in J. T. Maston, permission having been granted. "'Gentlemen,' said he, with an inspired accent, "'our president is right in placing the question of the projectile above all others.' The ball we are about to discharge at the moon is our ambassador to her, and I wish to consider it from a moral point of view. The cannonball, gentlemen, to my mind, is the most magnificent manifestation of human power. If Providence has created the stars and the planets, man has called the cannonball into existence. Let Providence claim the swiftness of electricity and of light of the stars, the comets, and the planets, of wind and sound, we claim to have invented the swiftness of the cannonball, a hundred times superior to that of the swiftest horses or railway train. How glorious will be the moment when, infinitely exceeding all hitherto attained velocities, we shall launch our new projectile with the rapidity of seven miles a second! Shall it not, gentlemen, shall it not be received up there with the honors due to a terrestrial ambassador? Overcome with emotion, the orator sat down and applied himself to a huge plate of sandwiches before him. And now, said Barbicane, let us quit the domain of poetry and come direct to the question. By all means, replied the members, each with his mouth full of sandwich. The problem before us, continued the President, is how to communicate to a projectile a velocity of 12,000 yards per second. Let us at present examine the velocities hitherto attained. General Morgan will be able to enlighten us on this point. And, the more easily, replied the General, that during the war I was a member of the Committee of Experiments. I may say, then, that the hundred-pounder Dahlgrens, which carried a distance of five thousand yards, impressed upon their projectile an initial velocity of five hundred yards a second. The Rodman Columbiad threw a shot weighing half a ton, a distance of six miles, with a velocity of eight hundred yards per second, a result which Armstrong and Palliser have never obtained in England. This, replied Barbicane, is, I believe, the maximum velocity ever attained? It is so, replied the general. Ah, groaned J. T. Maston, if my mortar had not burst. Yes, quietly replied Barbicane, but it did burst. We must take, then, for our starting point, this velocity of eight hundred yards. We must increase it twentyfold. Now, reserving for another discussion the means of producing this velocity, I will call your attention to the dimensions which it will be proper to assign to the shot. You understand that we have nothing to do here with projectiles weighing at most but half a ton. "'Why not?' demanded the Major. "'Because the shot,' quickly replied J. T. Maston, "'must be big enough to attract the attention of the inhabitants of the moon, if there are any?' "'Yes,' replied Barbicane, and for another reason more important still. "'What mean you?' asked the Major. "'I mean that it is not enough to discharge a projectile and then take no further notice of it. We must follow it throughout its course, up to the moment when it shall reach its goal.' "'What?' shouted the General and the Major, in great surprise. "'Undoubtedly,' replied Barbicane composedly or our experiment would produce no result. Uh, "'But then,' replied the Major, "'you will have to give this projectile enormous dimensions. "'No, be so good as to listen. "'You know that optical instruments have acquired great perfection. "'With certain telescopes we have succeeded in obtaining enlargements of six thousand times, "'and reducing the moon to within forty miles' distance. "'Now, at this distance, any objects sixty feet square would be perfectly visible. If, then, the penetrative power of telescopes has not been further increased, 
it is because that power detracts from their light, and the moon, which is but a reflecting mirror, does not give back sufficient light to enable us to perceive objects of lesser magnitude. "'Well, then, what do you propose to do?' asked the general. "'Would you give your projectile a diameter of sixty feet?' "'Not so.' "'Do you intend, then, to increase the luminous power of the moon?' "'Exactly so. If I can succeed in diminishing the density of the atmosphere through which the moon's light has to travel, I shall have rendered her light more intense. To effect that object it will be enough to establish a telescope on some elevated mountain. That is what we will do.' "'I give it up,' answered the Major. "'You have such a way of simplifying things. And what enlargement do you expect to obtain in this way?' one of forty-eight thousand times which should bring the moon within an apparent distance of five miles and in order to be visible objects need not have a diameter of more than nine feet so then cried j t maston our projectile need not be more than nine feet in diameter let me observe however interrupted major elphinstone this will involve a weight such as uh, my dear major replied barbicane before discussing its weight permit me to enumerate some of the marvels which our ancestors have achieved in this respect i don't mean to pretend that the science of gunnery has not advanced but it is as well to bear in mind that during the middle ages they obtained results more surprising i will venture to say than ours for instance, during the siege of Constantinople by Mahomet II in 1453, stone shot of 1,900 pounds weight were employed. At Malta, in the time of the Knights, there was a gun of the fortress of St. Elmo, which threw a projectile weighing 2,500 pounds. And now, what is the extent of what we have seen ourselves? Armstrong guns discharging shot of 500 pounds, and the Rodman guns projectiles of half a ton. It seems, then, that if our projectiles have gained in range, they have lost far more in weight. Now, if we turn our efforts in that direction, we ought to arrive, with the progress of science, at ten times the weight of the shot of Mahomet II and the Knights of Malta. Clearly, replied the Major, but what metal do you calculate upon employing? "'Simply cast iron,' said General Morgan. "'But,' interrupted the Major, "'since the weight of the shot is proportionate to its volume, "'an iron ball of nine feet in diameter would be of tremendous weight.' "'Yes, if it were solid, not if it were hollow.' "'Hollow? Then it would be a shell?' "'Yes, a shell,' replied Barbicane. "'Decidedly, it must be.' A solid shot of one hundred and eight inches should weigh more than two hundred thousand pounds, a weight evidently far too great. Still, as we must reserve a certain stability for our projectile, I propose to give it a weight of twenty thousand pounds. "'What, then, will be the thickness of the sides?' asked the Major. "'If we follow the usual proportion,' replied Morgan, a diameter of one hundred and eight inches would require sides of two feet thickness, or less. That would be too much, replied Barbicane, for you will observe that the question is not that of a shot intended to pierce an iron plate. It will suffice, therefore, to give its sides strong enough to resist the pressure of the gas. The problem, therefore, is this. What thickness ought a cast-iron shell to have— in order not to weigh more than twenty thousand pounds. Our clever secretary will soon enlighten us upon this point. "'Nothing easier,' replied the worthy secretary of the committee, and rapidly tracing a few algebraical formulae upon paper, among which N-square and X-square frequently appeared, he presently said, "'The sides will require a thickness of less than two inches.' "'Will that be enough?' asked the Major, doubtfully. "'Clearly not,' replied the President. "'What is to be done, then?' said Elphinstone, with a puzzled air. 
employ another metal instead of iron. Copper? said Morgan. No, that would be too heavy. I have better than that to offer. What then? asked the Major. Aluminium, replied Barbicane. Aluminium, cried his three colleagues in chorus. Unquestionably, my friends, this valuable metal possesses the whiteness of silver, the indestructibility of gold, the tenacity of iron, the fusibility of copper, the lightness of glass. It is easily wrought, it is very widely distributed, forming the base of most of the rocks, is three times lighter than iron, and seems to have been created for the express purpose of furnishing us with the material for our projectile. Uh, but, my dear President, said the Major, is not the cost price of aluminium extremely high? It was so at its first discovery, but it has fallen down to nine dollars the pound. Uh, but still, nine dollars the pound, replied the Major, who was not willing readily to give in. Even that is an enormous price. Undoubtedly, my dear Major, but not beyond our reach. What will the projectile weigh, then? asked Morgan. Here is the result of my calculations, replied Barbicane. A shot of 108 inches in diameter and 12 inches in thickness would weigh, in cast iron, 67,440 pounds. Cast in aluminium, its weight will be reduced to 19,250 pounds. Capital! cried the Major. But do you know that, at nine dollars the pound, this projectile will cost one hundred and seventy-three thousand and fifty dollars? I know it quite well. But fear not, my friends, the money will not be wanting for our enterprise. I will answer for it. Now, what say you to aluminium, gentlemen? Adopted! replied the three members of the committee. So ended the first meeting. The question of the projectile was definitively settled. End of chapter. Chapter 8. History of the Canon. The resolutions passed at the last meeting produced a great effect out of doors. Timid people took fright at the idea of a shot weighing twenty thousand pounds being launched into space, they asked what cannon could ever transmit a sufficient velocity to such a mighty mass. The minutes of the second meeting were destined triumphantly to answer such questions. The following evening the discussion was renewed. "'My dear colleagues,' said Barbicane, without further preamble, "'the subject now before us is the construction of the engine, its length, its composition, and its weight.' It is probable that we shall end by giving it gigantic dimensions, but however great may be the difficulties in the way, our mechanical genius will readily surmount them. Be good enough, then, to give me your attention, and do not hesitate to make objections at the close. I have no fear of them. The problem before us is how to communicate an initial force of 12,000 yards per second to a shell of 108 inches in diameter weighing twenty thousand pounds. Now, when a projectile is launched into space, what happens to it? It is acted upon by three independent forces. The resistance of the air, the attraction of the earth, and the force of impulsion with which it is endowed. Let us examine these three forces. The resistance of the air is of little importance. The atmosphere of the earth does not exceed forty miles. Now, with the given rapidity, the projectile will have traversed this in five seconds, and the period is too brief for the resistance of the medium to be regarded otherwise than as insignificant. Proceeding then to the attraction of the earth, that is, the weight of the shell, we know that this weight will diminish in the inverse ratio of the square of the distance. When a body left to itself falls to the surface of the earth, it falls five feet in the first second, and if the same body were removed 257,542 miles farther off, in other words, to the distance of the moon, its fall would be reduced to about half a line in the first second, 
That is almost equivalent to a state of perfect rest. Our business, then, is to overcome progressively this action of gravitation. The mode of accomplishing that is by the force of impulsion. "'There's the difficulty,' broke in the Major. "'True,' replied the President, "'but we will overcome that, for this force of impulsion will depend upon the length of the engine and the powder employed, the latter being limited only by the resisting power of the former. Our business, then, to-day, is with the dimensions of the cannon. Now, up to the present time, said Barbicane, our longest guns have not exceeded twenty-five feet in length. We shall therefore astonish the world by the dimensions we shall be obliged to adopt. It must evidently be, then, a gun of great range, since the length of the piece will increase the detention of the gas accumulated behind the projectile, but there is no advantage in passing certain limits. "'Quite so,' said the Major. "'What is the rule in such a case?' Ordinarily, the length of a gun is twenty to twenty-five times the diameter of the shot, and its weight two hundred thirty-five to two hundred forty times that of the shot. "'That is not enough!' cried J. T. Maston impetuously. "'I agree with you, my good friend, and, in fact, following this proportion for a projectile nine feet in diameter, weighing thirty thousand pounds, the gun would only have a length of— two hundred twenty-five feet, and a weight of seven million two hundred thousand pounds. Ridiculous, rejoined Maston, as well take a pistol. I think so, too, replied Barbicane. That is why I propose to quadruple that length, and to construct a gun of nine hundred feet. The general and the major offered some objections. Nevertheless, the proposition, actively supported by the secretary, was definitively adopted. But, said Elphinstone, what thickness must we give it? A thickness of six feet, replied Barbicane. I you surely don't think of mounting a mass like that upon a carriage? asked the Major. <laughs> it would be a superb idea, though, said Maston. But impracticable, replied Barbicane. No, I think of sinking this engine in the earth alone, binding it with hoops of wrought iron, and finally surrounding it with a thick mass of masonry of stone and cement. The piece once cast, it must be bored with great precision, so as to preclude any possible windage. So there will be no loss whatever of gas, and all the expansive force of the powder will be employed in the propulsion. One simple question— said Elphinstone. Is our gun to be rifled? No, certainly not, replied Barbicane. We require an enormous initial velocity, and you are well aware that a shot quits a rifled gun less rapidly than it does a smoothbore. True, rejoined the Major. The committee here adjourned for a few minutes to tea and sandwiches. On the discussion being renewed, Gentlemen, said Barbicane, we must now take into consideration the metal to be employed. Our cannon must be possessed of great tenacity, great hardness, be infusible by heat, indissoluble, and inoxidable by the corrosive action of acids. "'There is no doubt about that,' replied the Major. "'And as we shall have to employ an enormous quantity of metal, we shall not be at a loss for choice.' "'Well, then,' said Morgan, I propose the best alloy hitherto known, which consists of one hundred parts of copper, twelve of tin, and six of brass. I admit, replied the President, that this composition has yielded excellent results, but in the present case it would be too expensive, and very difficult to work. I think, then, that we ought to adopt a material excellent in its way and of low price, such as cast iron. "'What is your advice, Major?' "'I quite agree with you,' replied Elphinstone. "'In fact,' continued Barbicane, "'cast iron costs ten times less than bronze. "'It is easy to cast. "'It runs readily from the moulds of sand. "'It is easy of manipulation. "'It is at once economical of money and of time. 
In addition, it is excellent as a material, and I well remember that during the war, at the siege of Atlanta, some iron guns fired one thousand rounds at intervals of twenty minutes without injury. "'Cast iron is very brittle, though,' replied Morgan. "'Yes, but it, it possesses great resistance. I will now ask our worthy secretary to calculate the weight of a cast-iron gun with a bore of nine feet and a thickness of six feet of metal. "'In a moment,' replied Maston. Then, dashing off some algebraical formulae with marvellous facility, in a minute or two he declared the following result. "'A cannon will weigh sixty-eight thousand and forty tons, and at two cents a pound it will cost—' Two million five hundred ten thousand seven hundred and one dollars. Maston, the major, and the general regarded Barbicane with uneasy looks. Well, gentlemen, replied the president, I repeat what I said yesterday. Make yourselves easy. The millions will not be wanting. With this assurance of their president, the committee separated, after having fixed their third meeting for the following evening. End of chapter. Chapter 9. The Question of the Powders There remained for consideration merely the question of powders. The public awaited with interest its final decision. The size of the projectile, the length of the cannon being settled, what would be the quantity of powder necessary to produce impulsion? It is generally asserted that gunpowder was invented in the 14th century by the monk Schwartz, who paid for his grand discovery with his life. It is, however, pretty well proved that this story ought to be ranked amongst the legends of the Middle Ages. Gunpowder was not invented by anyone. It was the lineal successor of the Greek fire, which, like itself, was composed of sulfur and saltpeter. Few persons are acquainted with the mechanical power of gunpowder. Now this is precisely what is necessary to be understood in order to comprehend the importance of the question submitted to the committee. A liter of gunpowder weighs about two pounds. During combustion it produces four hundred liters of gas. This gas, on being liberated and acted upon by a temperature raised to twenty-four hundred degrees, occupies a space of four thousand liters Consequently, the volume of powder is to the volume of gas produced by its combustion as one to four thousand. One may judge, therefore, of the tremendous pressure of this gas when compressed within a space four thousand times too confined. All this was, of course, well known to the members of the committee when they met on the following evening. The first speaker on this occasion was Major Elphinstone, who had been the director of the gunpowder factories during the war. "'Gentlemen,' said this distinguished chemist, "'I begin with some figures which will serve as the basis of our calculation. The old twenty-four-pounder shot required for its discharge sixteen pounds of powder.' "'You are certain of the amount?' broke in Barbicane. "'Quite certain,' replied the major. The Armstrong cannon employs only seventy-five pounds of powder for a projectile of eight hundred pounds, and the Rodman Columbiad uses only one hundred sixty pounds of powder to send its half-ton shot a distance of six miles. These facts cannot be called in question, for I myself raised the point during the depositions taken before the Committee of Artillery. "'Quite true,' said the General. "'Well,' replied the Major, these figures go to prove that the quantity of powder is not increased with the weight of the shot. That is to say, if a 24-pounder shot requires 16 pounds of powder, in other words, if in ordinary guns we employ a quantity of powder equal to two-thirds of the weight of the projectile, this proportion is not constant. Calculate, and you will see that in place of 333 pounds of powder, the quantity is reduced to no more than 160 pounds. Oh, "'What are you aiming at?' asked the President. "'If you push your theories to extremes, my dear Major,' said J.T. Maston, "'you will get to this. 
that as soon as your shot becomes sufficiently heavy, you will not require any powder at all. <laughs> Our friend Meston is always at his jokes, even in serious matters, cried the Major. But let him make his mind easy. I am going presently to propose gunpowder enough to satisfy his artillerist propensities. I only keep to statistical facts when I say that during the war— and for the very largest guns, the weight of powder was reduced, as the result of experience, to a tenth part of the weight of the shot. "'Perfectly correct,' said Morgan. "'But before deciding the quantity of powder necessary to give the impulse, I think it would be as well. We shall have to employ a large-grained powder,' continued the Major. "'Its combustion is more rapid than that of the small.' "'No doubt about that,' replied Morgan. "'But it is very destructive, and ends by enlarging the bore of the pieces.' "'Granted, but that which is injurious to a gun destined to perform long service is not so to our Columbiad. We shall run no danger of an explosion, and it is necessary that our powder should take fire instantaneously in order that its mechanical effect may be complete.' "'We must have,' said Maston, "'several touch-holes, so as to fire it at different points at the same time.' "'Certainly,' replied Elphinstone, "'but that will render the working of the piece more difficult. I return, then, to my large-grained powder, which removes those difficulties. In his Columbiad charges, Robman employed a powder as large as chestnuts, made of willow charcoal, simply dried in cast-iron pans.' This powder was hard and glittering, left no trace upon the hand, contained hydrogen and oxygen in large proportion, took fire instantaneously, and, though very destructive, did not sensibly injure the mouthpiece. Up to this point Barbicane had kept aloof from the discussion. He left the others to speak while he himself listened. He had evidently got an idea. He now simply said— well, my friends, what quantity of powder do you propose? The three members looked at one another. Two hundred thousand pounds, at last said Morgan. Five hundred thousand, added the Major. Eight hundred thousand, screamed Maston. A moment of silence followed this triple proposal. It was at last broken by the President. Gentlemen, he quietly said, I start from this principle, that the resistance of a gun, constructed under the given conditions, is unlimited. I shall surprise our friend Maston, then, by stigmatizing his calculations as timid, and I propose to double his eight hundred thousand pounds of powder. Sixteen hundred thousand pounds!' shouted Maston, leaping from his seat. "'Just so.' "'We shall have to come, then, to my idea of a cannon half a mile long, "'for, you see, one million six hundred thousand pounds will occupy a space of about twenty thousand cubic feet, "'and since the contents of your cannon do not exceed fifty-four thousand cubic feet, it would be half full, "'and the bore will not be more than long enough for the gas to communicate to the projectile sufficient impulse.' "'Nevertheless,' said the President, I hold to that quantity of powder. Now, one million six hundred thousand pounds of powder will create six billion of liters of gas. Six thousand millions. You quite understand? What is to be done, then? said the general. The thing is very simple. We must reduce this enormous quantity of powder, while preserving to it its mechanical power. Good, but by what means? "'I am going to tell you,' replied Barbicane quietly. "'Nothing is more easy than to reduce this mass to one quarter of its bulk. "'You know that curious cellular matter which constitutes the elementary tissues of vegetables? "'This substance is found quite pure in many bodies, especially in cotton, "'which is nothing more than the down of the seeds of the cotton plant. "'Now cotton, combined with cold nitric acid,' becomes transformed into a substance eminently insoluble, combustible, and explosive. It was first discovered in 1832, 
by Braconneau, a French chemist, who called it xyloidine. In 1838, another Frenchman, Pelleuse, investigated its different properties, and finally, in 1846, Schoenbein, professor of chemistry at Bâle, proposed its employment for purposes of war. This powder, now called pyroxyle, or fulminating cotton, is prepared with great facility by simply plunging cotton for fifteen minutes in nitric acid, then washing it in water, then drying it, and it is ready for use. "'Nothing could be more simple,' said Morgan. "'Moreover, pyroxyle is unaltered by moisture, a valuable property to us, inasmuch as it would take several days to charge the cannon. It ignites at 170 degrees in place of 240, and its combustion is so rapid that one may set light to it on top of the ordinary powder without the latter having time to ignite. "'Perfect!' exclaimed the Major. "'Only it is more expensive.' "'What matter?' cried J.T. Maston. Finally, it imparts to projectiles a velocity four times superior to that of gunpowder. I will even add that if we mix with it one-eighth of its own weight of nitrate of potash, its expansive force is again considerably augmented. "'Will that be necessary?' asked the Major. "'I think not,' replied Barbicane. "'So, then.' In place of one million six hundred thousand pounds of powder, we shall have but four hundred thousand pounds of fulminating cotton, and since we can, without danger, compress five hundred pounds of cotton into twenty-seven cubic feet, the whole quantity will not occupy a height of more than one hundred eighty feet within the bore of the Columbiad. In this way the shot will have more than seven hundred feet of bore to traverse under a force of six billion litres of gas, before taking its flight towards the moon. At this junction J. T. Maston could not repress his emotion. He flung himself into the arms of his friend with the violence of a projectile, and Barbicane would have been stove in if he had not been bomb-proof. This incident terminated the third meeting of the committee. Barbicane and his bold colleagues, to whom nothing seemed impossible, had succeeded in solving the complex problems of projectile, cannon, and powder. Their plan was drawn up, and it only remained to put it in execution. "'A mere matter of detail! A bagatelle!' said J. T. Maston. End of chapter. Chapter 10. One Enemy versus Twenty-Five Millions of Friends the American public took a lively interest in the smallest details of the enterprise of the Gun Club. It followed day by day the discussions of the committee. The most simple preparation for the great experiment, the questions of figures which it involved, the mechanical difficulties to be resolved, in one word, the entire plan of work, roused the popular excitement to the highest pitch. The purely scientific attraction was suddenly intensified by the following incident. We have seen what legions of admirers and friends Barbicane's project had rallied round its author. There was, however, one single individual alone in all the states of the Union who protested against the attempt of the gun club. He attacked it furiously on every opportunity, and human nature is such that Barbicane felt more keenly the opposition of that one man than he did the applause of all the others. He was well aware of the motive of this antipathy, the origin of this solitary enmity, the cause of its personality and old standing, and in what rivalry of self-love it had its rise. This persevering enemy the president of the gun club had never seen. Fortunate that it was so, for a meeting between the two men would certainly have been attended with serious consequences. This rival was a man of science, like Barbicane himself, of a fiery, daring, and violent disposition, a pure Yankee. His name was Captain Nicholl. He lived at Philadelphia. Most people are aware of the curious struggle which arose during the Federal War between the guns and the armor of iron-plated ships. 
the result was the entire reconstruction of the navy of both the continents as the one grew heavier the other became thicker in proportion the merrimac the monitor the tennessee the weehawken discharged enormous projectiles themselves after having been armor-clad against the projectiles of others in fact they did to others that which they would not they should do to them that grand principle of immorality upon which rests the whole art of war now if barbicane was a great founder of shot nickel was a great forger of plates the one cast night and day at baltimore the other forged day and night at philadelphia as soon as ever barbicane invented a new shot nickel invented a new plate each followed a current of ideas essentially opposed to the other happily for these citizens so useful to their country a distance of from fifty to sixty miles separated them from one another and they had never yet met which of these two inventors had the advantage over the other it was difficult to decide from the results obtained by last accounts however it would seem that the armor plate would in the end have to give way to the shot nevertheless there were competent judges who had their doubts on the point at the last experiment the cylindro conical projectiles of barbicane stuck like so many pins in the nickel plates on that day the philadelphia iron forger then believed himself victorious and could not evince contempt enough for his rival but when the other afterwards substituted for conical shot simple six hundred pound shells at very moderate velocity the captain was obliged to give in in fact these projectiles knocked his best metal plate to shivers matters were at this stage and victory seemed to rest with a shot when the war came to an end on the very day when nickel had completed a new armor plate of wrought steel it was a masterpiece of its kind and bid defiance to all the projectiles in the world the captain had it conveyed to the polygon at washington challenging the president of the gun club to break it barbicane peace having been declared declined to try the experiment nickel now furious offered to expose his plate to the shock of any shot solid hollow round or conical refused by the president who did not choose to compromise his last success nickel disgusted by this obstinacy tried to tempt barbicane by offering him every chance he proposed to fix the plate within two hundred yards of the gun barbicane still obstinate in refusal a hundred yards not even seventy-five at fifty then roared the captain through the newspapers at twenty-five yards and i'll stand behind barbicane returned for answer that even if captain nicholl would be so good as to stand in front he would not fire any more nicholl could not contain himself at this reply threw out hints of cowardice that a man who refused to fire a cannon shot was pretty near being afraid of it the artillerists who fight at six miles distance are substituting mathematical formulas for individual courage to these insinuations barbicane returned no answer perhaps he never heard of them so absorbed was he in the calculations for his great enterprise when his famous communication was made to the gun club the captain's wrath passed all bounds with his intense jealousy was mingled a feeling of absolute impotence how was he to invent anything to beat this nine hundred feet columbiad what armor plate could ever resist a projectile of thirty thousand pounds weight overwhelmed at first under this violent shock he by and by recovered himself and resolved to crush the proposal by the weight of his arguments he then violently attacked the labors of the gun club published a number of letters in the newspapers endeavored to prove barbicane ignorant of the first principles of gunnery he maintained that it was absolutely impossible to impress upon any body whatever a velocity of twelve thousand yards per second that even with such a velocity a projectile of such a weight could not transcend the limits of the earth's atmosphere further still even regarding the velocity to be acquired and granting it to be sufficient 
the shell could not resist the pressure of the gas developed by the ignition of one million six hundred thousand pounds of powder and supposing it to resist that pressure it would be the less able to support that temperature it would melt on quitting the columbiad and fall back in a red-hot shower upon the heads of the imprudent spectators barbicane continued his work without regarding these attacks nickel then took up the question in its other aspects without touching upon its uselessness in all points of view he regarded the experiment as fraught with extreme danger both to the citizens who might sanction by their presence so reprehensible a spectacle and also to the towns in the neighbourhood of this deplorable cannon he also observed that if the projectile did not succeed in reaching its destination a result absolutely impossible it must inevitably fall back upon the earth and that the shock of such a mass multiplied by the square of its velocity would seriously endanger every point of the globe under the circumstances therefore and without interfering with the rights of free citizens it was a case for the intervention of government which ought not to endanger the safety of all for the pleasure of one individual spite of all his arguments however captain nicholl remained alone in his opinion nobody listened to him and he did not succeed in alienating a single admirer from the president of the gug club the latter did not even take the pains to refute the arguments of his rival nicholl driven into his last entrenchments and not able to fight personally in the cause resolved to fight with money he published therefore in the richmond inquirer a series of wagers conceived in these terms and on an increasing scale number one one thousand dollars that the necessary funds for the experiment of the gun club will not be forthcoming number two two thousand dollars that the operation of casting a cannon of nine hundred feet is impracticable and cannot possibly succeed number three three thousand dollars that it is impossible to load the columbiad and that the peroxyle will take fire spontaneously under the pressure of the projectile number four four thousand dollars that the columbiad will burst at the first fire number five five thousand dollars that the shot will not travel farther than six miles and that it will fall back again a few seconds after its discharge it was an important sum therefore which the captain risked in his invincible obstinacy he had no less than fifteen thousand dollars at stake notwithstanding the importance of the challenge on the nineteenth of may he received a sealed packet containing the following superbly laconic reply baltimore october nineteen dunn barbicane end of chapter chapter eleven florida and texas one question yet remained to be decided it was necessary to choose a favorable spot for the experiment according to the advice of the observatory of cambridge the gun must be fired perpendicularly to the plane of the horizon that is to say towards the zenith now the moon does not traverse the zenith except in places situated between zero and twenty-eight degrees of latitude it became then necessary to determine exactly that spot on the globe where the immense columbiad should be cast on the twentieth of october at a general meeting of the gun club barbicane produced a magnificent map of the united states gentlemen said he in opening the discussion i presume that we are all agreed that this experiment cannot and ought not to be tried anywhere but within the limits of the soil of the union now by good fortune certain frontiers of the united states extend downwards as far as the twenty-eighth parallel of the north latitude if you will cast your eye over this map you will see that we have at our disposal the whole of the southern portion of texas and florida it was finally agreed then that the columbiad must be cast on the soil of either texas or florida the result however of this decision was to create a rivalry entirely without precedent between the different towns of these two states 
to 28th parallel on reaching the american coast traverses the peninsula of florida dividing it into two nearly equal portions then plunging into the gulf of mexico it subtends the arc formed by the coast of alabama mississippi and louisiana then skirting texas off which it cuts an angle it continues its course over mexico crosses the sonora old california and loses itself in the pacific ocean it was therefore only those portions of texas and florida which were situated below this parallel which came within the prescribed conditions of latitude florida in its southern part reckons no cities of importance it is simply studded with forts raised against the roving indians one solitary town tampa town was able to put in a claim in favor of its situation in texas on the contrary the towns are much more numerous and important corpus christi in the county of nuaces and all the cities situated on the rio bravo laredo comolites san ignacio on the web rio grande city on the star edinburgh in the hidalgo santa rita el panda brownsville in the cameron formed an imposing league against the pretensions of florida so scarcely was the decision known when the texan and floridian deputies arrived at baltimore in an incredibly short space of time from that very moment president barbicane and the influential members of the gun club were besieged day and night by formidable claims if seven cities of greece contended for the honor of having given birth to homer here were two entire states threatening to come to blows about the question of a cannon the rival parties promenaded the streets with arms in their hands and at every occasion of their meeting a collision was to be apprehended which might have been attended with disastrous results happily the prudence and address of president barbicane averted the danger these personal demonstrations found a division in the newspapers of the different states the new york herald and the tribune supported texas while the times and the american review espoused the cause of the floridian deputies the members of the gun club could not decide to which to give the preference texas produced its array of twenty-six counties florida replied that twelve counties were better than twenty-six in a country only one-sixth part of the size texas plumed itself upon its three hundred thirty thousand natives florida with a far smaller territory boasted of being much more densely populated with fifty-six thousand the texians through the columns of the herald claimed that some regard should be had to a state which grew the best cotton in all america produced the best green oak for the service of the navy and contained the finest oil besides iron mines in which the yield was fifty per cent of pure metal to this the american review replied that the soil of florida although not equally rich afforded the best conditions for the moulding and casting of the columbiad consisting as it did of sand and argillaceous earth that may be all very well replied the texians but you must first get to this country now the communications with florida are difficult while the coast of texas offers the bay of galveston which possesses a circumference of fourteen leagues and is capable of containing the navies of the entire world <laughs> a pretty notion truly replied the papers in the interest of florida that of galveston bay below the twenty-ninth parallel have we not got a bay of Espirito Santo, opening precisely upon the twenty-eighth degree, and by which ships can reach Tampa Town by direct route? A fine bay, half choked with sand. Choked yourselves, returned the others. Thus the war went on for several days, when Florida endeavored to draw her adversary away on to fresh ground, and one morning the Times hinted that, the enterprise being essentially american it ought not to be attempted upon other than purely american territory to these words texas retorted american are we not as much so as you were not texas and florida both incorporated into the union in eighteen forty five 
Undoubtedly, replied the Times, but we have belonged to the Americans ever since 1820. Yes, returned the Tribune, after having been Spaniards or English for two hundred years, you were sold to the United States for five million dollars. Well, and why need we blush for that? Was not Louisiana bought from Napoleon in 1803 at the price of sixteen million dollars? Scandalous! roared the Texan deputies. A wretched little strip of country like Florida to dare to compare itself to Texas, who, in place of selling herself, asserted her own independence, drove out the Mexicans in March 2, 1836, and declared herself a federal republic after the victory gained by Samuel Houston on the banks of the San Jacinto over the troops of Santa Ana, a country, in fine, which voluntarily annexed itself to the United States of America. Yes, because it was afraid of the Mexicans, replied Florida. Afraid? From this moment the state of things became intolerable. A sanguinary encounter seemed daily imminent between the two parties in the streets of Baltimore. It became necessary to keep an eye upon the deputies. President Barbicane knew not which way to look. Notes, documents, letters full of menaces showered down upon his house. Which side ought he to take? As regarded the appropriation of the soil, the facility of communication, the rapidity of transport, the claims of both states were evenly balanced. As for political prepossessions, they had nothing to do with the question. This dead block had existed for some little time, when Barbicane resolved to get rid of it at once. He called a meeting of his colleagues, and laid before them a proposition which, it will be seen, was profoundly sagacious. On carefully considering, he said, what is going on now between Florida and Texas, it is clear that the same difficulties will recur with all the towns of the favored state. The rivalry will descend from state to city, and so on downwards. Now Texas possesses eleven towns within the prescribed conditions, which will further dispute the honor and create us new enemies, while Florida has only one. I go in, therefore, for Florida and Tampa Town." This decision, on being made known, utterly crushed the Texan deputies. Seized with an indescribable fury, they addressed threatening letters to the different members of the gun club by name. The magistrates had but one course to take, and they took it. They chartered a special train, forced the Texians into it whether they would or no, and they quitted the city with a speed of thirty miles an hour. Quickly, however, as they were dispatched, they found time to hurl one last and bitter sarcasm at their adversaries. Alluding to the extent of Florida, a mere peninsula confined between two seas, they pretended that it could never sustain the shock of the discharge, and that it would bust up at the very first shot. "'Very well, let it bust up,' replied the Floridians, with a brevity worthy of the days of ancient Sparta." End of chapter. Chapter 12. Irby et Orby. The astronomical, mechanical, and topographical difficulties resolved, finally came the question of finance. The sum required was far too great for any individual, or even any state, to provide the requisite millions. President Barbicane undertook, despite of the matter being a purely American affair, to render it one of universal interest, and to request the financial cooperation of all peoples. It was, he maintained, the right and the duty of the whole earth to interfere in the affairs of its satellite. The subscription opened at Baltimore, extended properly to the whole world, Irby et Orby. This subscription was successful beyond all expectation, notwithstanding that it was a question not of lending but of giving the money. It was a purely disinterested operation in the strictest sense of the term, and offered not the slightest chance of profit. 
The effect, however, of Barbicane's communication was not confined to the frontiers of the United States. It crossed the Atlantic and Pacific, invading simultaneously Asia and Europe, Africa and Oceania. The observatories of the Union placed themselves in immediate communication with those of foreign countries. Some, such as those of Paris, Petersburg, Berlin, Stockholm, Hamburg, Malta, Lisbon, Benares, Madras, and others, transmitted their good wishes. The rest maintained a prudent silence, quietly awaiting the result. As for the observatory at Greenwich, seconded as it was by the twenty-two astronomical establishments of Great Britain, it spoke plainly enough. It boldly denied the possibility of success, and pronounced in favour of the theories of Captain Nicholl. But this was nothing more than mere English jealousy. On the 8th of October, President Barbicane published a manifesto full of enthusiasm, in which he made an appeal to all persons of good will upon the face of the earth. This document, translated into all languages, met with immense success. Subscription lists were opened in all the principal cities of the Union, with a central office at the Baltimore Bank, 9 Baltimore Street. In addition, subscriptions were received at the following banks in the different states of the two continents at vienna with s m de rothschild petersburg at stieglitz and company paris the credit mobilier stockholm toddy and afferudsen london n m rothschild and son turin arjwin and company berlin mendelssohn geneva Lombard, Odier, and Company, Constantinople, the Ottoman Bank, Brussels, J. Lambert, Madrid, Daniel Weisweller, Amsterdam, Netherlands Credit Company, Rome, Torlonia and Company, Lisbon, Le Chesney, Copenhagen, Private Bank, Rio Janeiro, Ditto, Montevideo, Ditto, Valparaiso and Lima, Thomas La Chambre and Company, Mexico, Martin Duran and Company. Three days after the manifesto of President Barbicane, four millions of dollars were paid into the different towns of the Union. With such a balance, the gun club might begin operations at once. But some days later, advices were received to the effect that the foreign subscriptions were being eagerly taken up. Certain countries distinguished themselves by their liberality. Others untied their purse-strings with less faculty. Matter of temperament. Figures are, however, more eloquent than words, and here is the official statement of the sums which were paid in to the credit of the gun club at the close of the subscription. Russia paid in, as her contingent, the enormous sum of three hundred sixty eight thousand seven hundred thirty three roubles no one need be surprised at this who bears in mind the scientific taste of the russians and the impetus which they have given to astronomical studies thanks to their numerous observatories france began by deriding the pretensions of the americans the moon served as a pretext for a thousand stale puns and a score of ballads in which bad taste contested the palm with ignorance but as formerly the French paid before singing, so now they paid after having had their laugh, and they subscribed for a sum of 1,253,930 francs. At that price they had a right to enjoy themselves a little. Austria showed herself generous in the midst of her financial crisis. Her public contributions amounted to the sum of 216,000 florins, a perfect godsend. Fifty two thousand rix dollars were the remittance of Sweden and Norway. The amount is large for the country, but it would undoubtedly have been considerably increased had the subscription been open in Christiania simultaneously with that at Stockholm. For some reason or other, the Norwegians did not like to send their money to Sweden. Prussia, by a remittance of two hundred fifty thousand dollars, testified her high approval of the enterprise. Turkey behaved generously, but she had a personal interest in the matter. The moon, in fact, regulates the cycle of her years and her fast of Ramadan. 
she could do no less than give one million three hundred seventy two thousand six hundred forty piastres and she gave them with an eagerness which denoted however some pressure on the part of the government belgium distinguished herself among the second-rate states by a grant of five hundred thirteen thousand francs about two centimes per head of her population holland and her colonies interested themselves to the extent of one hundred ten thousand florins only demanding an allowance of five per cent discount for paying ready money denmark a little contracted in territory gave nevertheless nine thousand ducats proving her love for scientific experiments the germanic confederation pledged itself to thirty four thousand two hundred eighty five florins it was impossible to ask for more besides they would not have given it though very much crippled italy found two hundred thousand lire in the pockets of her people if she had had venetia she would have done better but she had not the states of the church thought that they could not send less than seven thousand forty roman crowns and portugal carried her devotion to science as far as thirty thousand cruzados it was the widow's might eighty-six piastres but self-constituted empires are always rather short of money two hundred fifty seven francs this was the modest contribution of switzerland to the american work one must freely admit that she did not see the practical side of the matter it did not seem to her that the mere dispatch of a shot to the moon could possibly establish any relation of affairs with her and it did not seem prudent to her to embark her capital in so hazardous an enterprise after all perhaps she was right as to spain she could not scrape together more than one hundred ten reals she gave as an excuse that she had her railways to finish the truth is that science is not favourably regarded in that country it is still in a backward state and moreover certain spaniards not by any means the least educated did not form a correct estimate of the bulk of the projectile compared with that of the moon they feared that it would disturb the established order of things in that case it were better to keep aloof which they did to the tune of some reals there remained but england and we know the contemptuous antipathy with which she received barbicane's proposition the english have but one soul for the whole twenty-six millions of inhabitants which great britain contains they hinted that the enterprise of the gun club was contrary to the principle of non-intervention and they did not subscribe a single farthing at this intimation the gun club merely shrugged its shoulders and returned to its great work when south america that is to say peru chile brazil the provinces of la plata and colombia had poured forth their quota into their hands the sum of three hundred thousand dollars it found itself in possession of a considerable capital of which the following is a statement united states subscriptions four million dollars foreign subscriptions one million four hundred forty six thousand six hundred seventy five dollars total five million four hundred forty six thousand six hundred seventy five dollars such was the sum which the public poured into the treasury of the gun club let no one be surprised at the vastness of the amount the work of casting boring masonry the transport of workmen their establishment in an almost uninhabited country the construction of furnaces and workshops the plant the powder the projectile and incidental expenses would according to the estimates absorb nearly the whole certain cannon shots in the federal war cost a thousand dollars apiece this one of president barbicane unique in the annals of gunnery might well cost five thousand times more on the twentieth of october a contract was entered into with the manufactory at cold spring near new york which during the war had furnished the largest parrot cast iron guns it was stipulated between the contracting parties that the manufactory of cold spring should engage to transport to tampa town in southern florida the necessary materials for casting the columbiad the work was bound to be completed at latest by the fifteenth of october following 
and the cannon delivered in good condition under penalty of a forfeit of one hundred dollars a day to the moment when the moon should again present herself under the same conditions that is to say in eighteen years and eleven days the engagement of the workmen their pay and all the necessary details of the work devolved upon the gold spring company this contract executed in duplicate was signed by Barbicane, president of the Gun Club, of the one part, and T. Murfison, director of the Cold Spring Manufactory, of the other, who thus executed the deed on behalf of their respective principals. End of chapter. Chapter 13. Stones Hill. When the decision was arrived at by the Gun Club, to the disparagement of Texas, every one in America, where reading is an universal acquirement, set to work to study the geography of Florida. Never before had there been such a sale for works like Bertram's Travels in Florida, Roman's Natural History of East and West Florida, William's Territory of Florida, and Cleland on the Cultivation of the Sugar Cane in Florida. It became necessary to issue fresh editions of these works. Barbicane had something better to do than to read. He desired to see things with his own eyes, and to mark the exact position of the proposed gun. So without a moment's loss of time, he placed at the disposal of the Cambridge Observatory the funds necessary for the construction of a telescope, and entered into negotiations with the House of Breadwill and Company of Albany, for the construction of an aluminium projectile of the required size. He then quitted Baltimore, accompanied by J. T. Maston, Major Elphinstone, and the manager of the Cold Spring Factory. On the following day the four fellow travellers arrived at New Orleans. There they immediately embarked on board the Tempico, a dispatch boat belonging to the Federal Navy, which the government had placed at their disposal and, getting up steam, the banks of the Louisiana speedily disappeared from sight. The passage was not long. Two days after starting, the Tampico, having made four hundred and eighty miles, came in sight of the coast of Florida. On a nearer approach, Barbicane found himself in view of a low, flat country of somewhat barren aspect. After coasting along a series of creeks abounding in lobsters and oysters, the Tampico entered the bay of Espirito Santo, where she finally anchored in a small natural harbor formed by the embouchure of the river Hillisborough at 7 p.m. on the 22nd October. Our four passengers disembarked at once. Gentlemen, said Barbicane, we have no time to lose. Tomorrow we must obtain horses and proceed to reconnoiter the country. Barbicane had scarcely set his foot on shore when three thousand of the inhabitants of Tampa Town came forth to meet him, an honor due to the president who had signalized their country by his choice. Declining, however, every kind of ovation, Barbicane ensconced himself in a room at the Franklin Hotel. On the morrow, some of those small horses of the Spanish breed, full of vigor and of fire, stood snorting under his windows but instead of four steeds there were fifty, together with their riders. Barbicane descended with his three fellow-travellers, and much astonished were they all to find themselves in the midst of such a cavalcade. He remarked that every horseman carried a carbine slung across his shoulders and pistols in his holsters. On expressing his surprise at these preparations he was speedily enlightened by a young Floridian, who quietly said, "'Sir, there are Seminoles there.' "'What do you mean by Seminoles?' "'Savages who scour the prairies. We thought it best, therefore, to escort you on your road.' "'Pooh!' cried J. T. Maston, mounting his steed. "'All right,' said the Floridian. "'But it is true enough, nevertheless.' "'Gentlemen,' answered Barbicane, "'I thank you for your kind attention, but it is time to be off.' It was five a.m. when Barbicane and his party, quitting Tampa Town, made their way along the coast in the direction of Alafia Creek. This little river falls into Hillisborough Bay, twelve miles above Tampa Town. Barbicane and his escort coasted along its right bank to the eastward. 
Soon the waves of the bay disappeared behind a bend of rising ground, and the Floridian Champagne alone offered itself to view. Florida, discovered on Palm Sunday in 1512 by Juan Ponce de Leon, was originally named Pascia Florida. It little deserved that designation with its dry and parched coasts, but after some few miles of tract the nature of the soil gradually changes, and the country shows itself worthy of the name. Cultivated plains soon appear, where are united all the productions of the northern and tropical floras, terminating in prairies abounding with pineapples and yams, tobacco, rice, cotton plants, and sugar canes, which extend beyond reach of sight, flinging their riches broadcast with careless prodigality. Barbicane appeared highly pleased on observing the progressive elevation of the land, and in answer to a question of J. T. Maston, replied, "'My worthy friend, we cannot do better than sink our Columbiad in these high grounds.' "'To get nearer to the moon, perhaps?' said the secretary of the gun-club. "'Not exactly.' replied Barbicane, smiling. Do you not see that amongst these elevated plateaus we shall have a much easier work of it? No struggles with the water-springs, which will save us long and expensive tubings, and we shall be working in daylight instead of down a deep and narrow well. Our business, then, is to open our trenches upon ground some hundreds of yards above the level of the sea. You are right, sir, struck in Murchison, the engineer, and, if I mistake not, we shall ere long find a suitable spot for our purpose. "'I wish we were at the first stroke of the pickaxe,' said the President. "'And I wish we were at the last!' cried J. T. Maston. About ten a.m. the little band had crossed a dozen miles. To fertile plains succeeded a region of forests. There perfumes of the most varied kinds mingled together in tropical perfusion. These almost impenetrable forests were composed of pomegranates, orange trees, citrons, figs, olives, apricots, bananas, huge vines whose blossoms and fruits rivaled each other in color and perfume. Beneath the odorous shade of these magnificent trees fluttered and warbled a little world of brilliantly plumaged birds. J. T. Maston and the Major could not repress their admiration on finding themselves in presence of the glorious beauties of this wealth of nature. President Barbicane, however, less sensitive to these wonders, was in haste to press forward. The very luxuriance of the country was displeasing to him. They hastened onwards, therefore, and were compelled to ford several rivers, not without danger, for they were infested with huge alligators from fifteen to eighteen feet long. Maston courageously menaced them with his steel hook, but he only succeeded in frightening some pelicans and teal, while tall flamingos stared stupidly at the party. At length these denizens of the swamps disappeared in their turn. Smaller trees became thinly scattered amongst less dense thickets. A few isolated groups detached in the midst of endless plains over which ranged herds of startled deer. "'At last!' cried Barbicane, rising in his stirrups. Here we are at the region of pines. Yes, and of savages, too, replied the Major. In fact, some Seminoles had just come in sight upon the horizon. They rode violently backwards and forwards on their fleet horses, brandishing their spears or discharging their guns with a dull report. These hostile demonstrations, however, had no effect upon Barbicane and his companions. They were then occupying the center of a rocky plain, which the sun scorched with its parching rays. This was formed by a considerable elevation of the soil, which seemed to offer to the members of the gun club all the conditions requisite for the construction of their columbiad. Halt! said Barbicane, reining up. Has this place any local appellation? It's called Stones Hill, replied one of the Floridians. Barbicane, without saying a word, dismounted, seized his instruments, and began to note his position with extreme exactness. The little band, drawn up in rear, watched his proceedings in profound silence. At this moment the sun passed the meridian. 
Barbicane, after a few moments, rapidly wrote down the result of his observations, and said, This spot is situated eighteen hundred feet above the level of the sea, in twenty-seven degrees seven minutes north latitude, and five degrees seven minutes west longitude of the meridian of Washington. It appears to me by its rocky and barren character to offer all the conditions requisite for our experiment. On that plain will be raised our magazines, workshops, furnaces, and workmen huts. And here, from this very spot, said he, stamping his foot on the summit of Stones Hill, hence shall our projectile take its flight into the regions of the solar world. End of chapter. Chapter 14 Pickaxe and Trowel The same evening Barbicane and his companions returned to Tampa Town, and Murchison, the engineer, re-embarked on board the Tampico for New Orleans. His object was to enlist an army of workmen, and to collect together the greater part of the materials. The members of the gun club remained at Tampa Town for the purpose of setting on foot the preliminary works by the aid of the people of the country. Eight days after its departure, the Tampico returned into the Bay of Espirito Santo with a whole flotilla of steamboats. Murchison had succeeded in assembling together fifteen hundred artisans. Attracted by the high pay and considerable bounties offered by the gun club, he had enlisted a choice legion of stokers, iron founders, lime burners, miners, brick makers, and artisans of every trade, without distinction of color. As many of these people brought their families with them, their departure resembled a perfect emigration. On the 31st October, at ten o'clock in the morning, the troop disembarked on the quays of Tampa Town, and one may imagine the activity which pervaded that little town, whose population was thus doubled in a single day. During the first few days they were busy discharging the cargo brought by the flotilla, the machines and the rations, as well as a large number of huts constructed of iron plates, separately pieced and numbered. At the same period Barbicane laid the first sleepers of a railway fifteen miles in length intended to unite Stones Hill with Tampa Town. On the 1st of November Barbicane quitted Tampa Town with a detachment of workmen, and on the following day the whole town of huts was erected round Stones Hill. This they enclosed with palisades, and in respect of energy and activity, it might have shortly been mistaken for one of the great cities of the Union. Everything was placed under a complete system of discipline, and the works were commenced in most perfect order. The nature of the soil having been carefully examined, by means of repeated borings, the work of excavation was fixed for the 4th of November. On that day Barbicane called together his foremen, and addressed them as follows. "'You are well aware, my friends, of the object with which I have assembled you together in this wild part of Florida. Our business is to construct a cannon measuring nine feet in its interior diameter, six feet thick, and with a stone revetment of nineteen and a half feet in thickness.' We have, therefore, a well of sixty feet in diameter to dig down to a depth of nine hundred feet. This great work must be completed within eight months, so you have two million five hundred forty-three thousand four hundred cubic feet of earth to excavate in two hundred fifty-five days. That is to say, in round numbers, two thousand cubic feet per day." That which would present no difficulty to a thousand navvies working in open country will be, of course, more troublesome in a comparatively confined space. However, the thing must be done, and I reckon for its accomplishment upon your courage as much as upon your skill. At eight o'clock in the morning the first stroke of the pickaxe was struck upon the soil of Florida, and from that moment that prince of tools was never inactive for one moment in the hands of the excavators. The gangs relieved each other every three hours. On the 4th of November fifty workmen commenced digging, in the very centre of the enclosed space on the summit of Stones Hill, a circular hole sixty feet in diameter. 
the pickaxe first struck upon a kind of black earth, six inches in thickness, which was speedily disposed of. To this earth succeeded two feet of fine sand, which was carefully laid aside as being valuable for serving for the casting of the inner mould. After the sand appeared some compact white clay, resembling the chalk of Great Britain, which extended down to a depth of four feet. Then the iron of the picks struck upon the hard bed of the soil, a kind of rock formed of petrified shells, very dry, very solid, and which the picks could with difficulty penetrate. At this point the excavation exhibited a depth of six feet and a half, and the work of the masonry was begun. At the bottom of this excavation they constructed a wheel of oak, a kind of circle strongly bolted together, and of immense strength. The centre of this wooden disc was hollowed out to a diameter equal to the exterior diameter of the Columbiad. Upon this wheel rested the first layers of the masonry, the stones of which were bound together by hydraulic cement, with irresistible tenacity. The workmen, after laying the stones from the circumference to the centre, were thus enclosed within a kind of well twenty-one feet in diameter. When this work was accomplished, the miners resumed their picks and cut away the rock from underneath the wheel itself, taking care to support it as they advanced upon blocks of great thickness. At every two feet which the hole gained in depth, they successively withdrew the blocks. The wheel then sank little by little, and with it the massive ring of masonry, on the upper bed of which the masons laboured incessantly, always reserving some vent-holes to permit the escape of gas during the operation of casting. This kind of work required on the part of the workmen extreme nicety and minute attention. More than one, in digging underneath the wheel, was dangerously injured by the splinters of stone, but their ardour never relaxed, night or day. By day they worked under the rays of the scorching sun, by night under the gleam of the electric light. The sounds of the picks against the rock, the bursting of mines, the grinding of the machines, the wreaths of smoke scattered through the air, traced around Stones Hill a circle of terror which the herds of buffaloes and the war-parties of the Seminoles never ventured to pass. Nevertheless, the works advanced regularly, as the steam cranes actively removed the rubbish. Of unexpected obstacles there was little account, and with regard to foreseen difficulties, they were speedily disposed of. At the expiration of the first month the well had attained the depth assigned for that lapse of time, that is, 112 feet. This depth was doubled in December, and trebled in January. During the month of February the workmen had to contend with a sheet of water which made its way right across the outer soil. It became necessary to employ very powerful pumps and compressed engines to drain it off, so as to close up the orifice from whence it issued, just as one stops a leak on board ship. They at last succeeded in getting the upper hand of these untoward streams, only, in consequence of the loosening of the soil, the wheel partly gave way, and a slight partial settlement ensued. This accident cost the life of several workmen. No fresh occurrence thenceforward arrested the progress of the operation, and on the 10th of June, twenty days before the expiration of the period fixed by Barbicane, the well, lined throughout with its facing of stone, had attained the depth of nine hundred feet. At the bottom the masonry rested upon a massive block measuring thirty feet in thickness, whilst on the upper portion it was level with the surrounding soil. President Barbicane and the members of the Gun Club warmly congratulated their engineer Murchison. The Cyclopean work had been accomplished with extraordinary rapidity. During these eight months Barbicane never quitted Stones Hill for a single instant. Keeping ever close by the work of excavation, he busied himself incessantly with the welfare and health of his workpeople, and was singularly fortunate in warding off the epidemics common to large communities of men, and so disastrous in those regions of the globe which are exposed to the influences of tropical climates. 
Many workmen, it is true, paid with their lives for the rashness inherent in these dangerous labours, but these mishaps are impossible to be avoided, and they are classed amongst details with which the Americans trouble themselves but little. They have in fact more regard for human nature in general than for the individual in particular. Nevertheless, Barbicane professed opposite principles to these, and put them in force at every opportunity. So, thanks to his care, his intelligence, his useful intervention in all difficulties, his prodigious and humane sagacity, the average of accidents did not exceed that of transatlantic countries, noted for their excessive precautions, France, for instance, among others, where they reckon about one accident for every two hundred thousand francs of work. End of chapter.